I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. Today's episode is a lecture given at Rewriting the Future, 100 Years of Esoteric Modernism and Psychoanalysis. This talk is by Jesse Hathaway Diaz and is called Apocalyptic Corazon. Jesse Hathaway Diaz is a folklorist, diviner, artist, and performer living in New York City. He has a master's degree in performing arts and initiations in several forms of witchcraft from both Europe and the Americas. He is a lifelong student of Mexican curandismo, a priest of Oblata in the Lukumi Orisha tradition, and a Tata Kimbanda. He is also a member of the experimental theater group Jeki, based in New York City. He is half of Wolf and Goat, a store specializing in occult art, esoterica, and materia magica from many traditions, including traditional witchcraft and kimbanda. His blog can be found at serpentshod.com. That's S-E-R-P-E-N-T-S-H-O-D.com. And the website for Wolf and Goat is wolf-and-goat.com. That's W-O-L-F-A-N-D-G-O-A-T.com. His writings have been published by Scarlet Imprint and Revelor Press, where he also co-edits the Folk Necromancy in Transmission series. With Dr. Al Cummins, he is co-host of the Radio Free Golgotha podcast, RadioFreeGolgotha.com. That's R-A-D-I-O-F-R-E-E-G-O-L-G-O-T-H-A dot com. As with most Rendering Unconscious podcast episodes, there is a video of this on YouTube. Just visit Trapart Film's YouTube channel. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T Film at YouTube. You can see the full panel of Jesse's presentation along with a presentation by Langston Kahn called Shades and Shadows. How Our Unresolved Ancestors and Denied Selves Hold the Keys to Our Collective Liberation. The full panel on YouTube also includes the Q&A at the end. If you'd like to hear Langston's episode, visit Rendering Unconscious Podcast, episode 57. For more about this conference, visit psychartcult.org. That's P-S-Y-C-H-A-R-T-C-U-L-T dot org. Collected papers from the first conference, Psychoanalysis, Art, and the Occult, given in London 2016, can be found at Trapart's website. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry, published by Trapart Books, 2019. For more, please visit our publisher's website, trapart.net. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net. Many thanks to our supporters at Patreon. You too can support the podcast by visiting patreon.com forward slash V-A-N-E-S-S-A 
2-3-C-A-R-L. Your support is so appreciated. You can follow me on social media at Ra Sin. That's R A W S I N underscore on Twitter and Instagram. It's easy to remember as my name is Vanessa Rawlings Sinclair. You can also visit my website, drvanessasinclair.net. And the main website for the podcast, renderingunconscious.org. Um, so the, the talk is lovingly called, uh, you'll have to bear with me, I will try to speak slowly because I really try and cram way too much in. Um, my sense of time is terrible. Uh, apocalyptic corazón. So combining the word apocalyptic and corazón, which is a Spanish word for heart. But I also really like the play on oración, which is very close to oración, prayer. Um, and I also like that it makes a copyright symbol in the middle. <laughs> so, uh, the end of days cosmic vision that makes death our mother. This, this little handsome uh, fellow is Mictlán Tecutli, the Lord of the Dead, who is found at the bottom layer of the nine hells in Aztec cosmology, and that's the sacred heart of Jesus. This will not become any clearer as we go, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, second title, Catholicism is an umbrella, there is no spoon. Uh, major theme with me. Uh, I, I think uh, Catholicism tends to be something that is defined a lot by non-Catholics, for those of us that grew up with Hispanic Catholicism. This Catholicism is a culture and a lingua franca, but is not Roman Catholicism. It is, we'll explain why, that will become clear. Another title, A Slow Pilgrimage Towards, For, With, Santissima Muerte, Our Lady of Bone, Blood, and Decay, Empress of the Land of Victlan, and Queen of Multiple Inheritances, and a gratuitous exploration of the Mexican Cosmovision for the navigating thereof. What the earth gives, the earth must eat, and death is a mother that accepts us all. This is the Mexican deity known as Tlatecutli, which means Lord of the Earth, but it is actually a goddess. It is the goddess that swallows the sun in the West. So this is the Earth that eats us. Also interesting that it's the eagle flying above, which is the symbol of empire and authority. So all empires, too, must fall. Keep it moving. If you don't use your life well, give it to someone who might. Alternatively titled, let us make tortillas with our bones to feed our future past selves. Okay. Going in. So I figure the road to uh, the bottom of the underworld is going to have many um, reminders of death as we go. So I kind of put a lot of intercalary images of the Mexican concepts of death as we go. Because there were far more images and um, it'll keep me uh, wonderfully tangentialized but still progress me to the next slide. So this is, this is a statue of Mictlán Tecutli. Um, this is actually like nine feet tall. And the plugs in the head here were filled with the curly hair of sacrificial victims. So it was, he had lots of lovely curly hair. <laughs> um, the, the lovely kind of flower thing you see hanging out the bottom here, that's the liver. And it's the seat of a very important life essence soul, a, an animistic center in the body. So the rib cage with the flowering liver hanging out the bottom is very important. Um, and he's ready to receive you. <laughs> So, cosmogenesis in nonlinear time, a creation story yet to happen. This is the divine couple, um, collectively known sometimes as Omateot. Um, Nahuatl, it has this lovely t at the end of it. It's written as TL. You're familiar with it probably as chocolate comes from chocolate and tomato comes from tome, tomate. Um, so, Omateot means the energy of duality. And it is first described as Omatecutli. The Lord and Lady of Tunis, of duality. And here they are at their cosmic fire pit, which is also a weaving of fire and light built upon the bones of the dead. And this is because creation is ongoing. Omatekutli and Omasihuat, the Lord and Lady of Death, are weaving the fabric of reality. And I'm going to read off my phone here so that I don't uh, make too much craziness. Uh, the divine energy, Teot, uh, is... Ceaseless, 
It's self-becoming, self-presenting, self-unfolding. It's generating and regenerating the cosmos constantly, eternal weaving of the fabric of reality. Because of this animistic belief, all things are empowered. There's no division between symbolic and physical, psychological, and medical causality. All of those things can be worked to affect the other. It does not mean that they aren't distinct, but physical, something physical can be done to affect the, psycho, the psyche in this view. So in the beginning of creation, which can happen tomorrow, or it happened yesterday, or it's happening right now, uh, the first thing that happens is that this warp and weft is really what's describing the vertical and the horizontal. There's an in-betweenness between uh, these fibers. They split into the four directions, and the first thing that we know about the four directions is that we don't know what they are. Mm. The first god that emanates in all four directions is Tezcatlipoca, which is the lord of the smoking mirror. He is the lord of night and mystery. Now, because things don't stay in mystery for too long, three of the Tezcatlipocas turn into other gods. They turn into rain, they turn into breath, they turn into war and sunlight. One of them has to stay mystery, though. So this is the one that is the, the black Tezcatlipoca, the one that we can never know. This is the Lord of Night. This is um, Yolkat. This is uh, Ipanemwani. He, he in whom we move and have our existence, an epithet. Um, the enemy on both sides. Love that one. Um, he whose slaves we are even unto himself. Lots of lovely titles. His foot is actually an obsidian mirror that is used for scrying. Um, in the classic sense, but when he, in one of the previous creations, because the world gets created over and over and over again, he fought the giant uh, Saba slash crocodile monster, and he ripped off the crocodile's jaw, and the crocodile took off his foot, so he replaced it with one of his main tools, which is the smoking mirror. The dances for him, he always limps, which is wonderfully dramatic. This is reflected in this, this is the Aztec calendar stone, you may have seen this before. So these four things around this central disk, which is representative of the sun, these are the four previous suns here. This is the fifth sun in the middle, the age we are currently in, although some say it stopped with the Spanish conquest, and we are now in the sixth sun, but that's a whole alternative reality that is uh, harder, it's another discussion. But four suns here, those are the previous attempts at trying to make the universe work. <laughs> Um, it took them at least five tries. What's significant about it is that this sun is not the jaguar sun, it's not the wind sun, it is the sun of movement. It moves in the sky and therefore does not destroy us by burning us. It still can destroy us by its heat, but movement itself is dynamic. This is the age of dy dynamism? Is that an English word? Yes, okay, great. Um, and the calendar stone, which Deceptively, the only calendrical part is this ring right here. Everything else is ornamentation. The 20-day signs around the outside right here represent an interaction between um, 13 numbers and 20-day signs that kind of like spokes go into each other and show a 260-day cycle that is the ritual calendar. There are many calendars because the agricultural calendar is lovingly solar-based. The everyday calendar is lovingly lunar-based. This is Venusian or human gestation-based. So the ritual calendar, it is believed that every 260 days, the universe repeats itself on some level. So if we start with one crocodile in 260 days, there will be the day one crocodile again, and that day contains the sameness as the first one crocodile. It will repeat. This is akin to believing that, or acting as if every Wednesday, which we use, we have weeks within a month, we have months, so the first Wednesday of January would be like the first Wednesday of January last year. Something in that, the Wednesdayness of something, the Januaryness of something. Um, the order gets really crazy on this calendar, but this calendar is very important because if you look at, interestingly, consciousness and unconsciousness, in Aztec belief, you are not born with a face. You earn a face by interacting with the world. So you're born unconscious and you slowly find ways of expressing what it is that you came with. And by the seventh year, around then, you're actually given a unique name. Before that, you're called by your calendar birth date, which they controlled also if you were born on an unlucky day. They didn't expose you to the sun so that they could control your name better and therefore give you a better chance at surviving in the world or perhaps not introducing chaos into the civilization. So the interesting side of that uh, with 
don't know what that is. All of these day signs are also corresponding to the body. So each of us has a governing day sign that actually is a soul inside your head, little alien that comes in with the first ray of light that hits you, compared to fire sticks starting a fire in a log. So the thing that animates you is this first ray of light that has a little alien soul that embodies it, that goes into your head, which is an impersonal soul. But there is this connection to everything we do. Everything has this light hitting it. So plants have a day soul because the first time they're exposed to light, they have a soul. They also have a life force soul, that liver that's hanging out the bottom of the Lord of Death because they have that. What they don't have is a personal soul, which we have, which is our heart. So, another death god, He's, I, he kind of looks like Roger, um, <laughs> a little bit, right? Yeah. Um, okay. Whew, okay. <laughs> so, composition of the universe. Just, you know, small talk. Um, the sun of movement. Olin. This is that, the sun, if you remember the Aztec calendar stone. I can actually show you the Aztec. See that symbol in the middle, how it's still showing the overlapping right there? It's showing that the sun is in movement. It's also the symbol of earthquake or revolution. Um, this, this gets crazy. So this is what um, Maffey, who's a current specialist in, in Aztec philosophy, calls an enamic pair or an agonistic enamic pair. I tend to call them something else, but I'll go through the descriptions by different people. Um, Austin calls them dual opposition of contrary elements. Tedlock calls or contrasts dialectical or complementary dualism of Mesoamerica with the analytical or oppositional dualism of European philosophy. Tedlock characterizes Mesoamerican dualities as complementary rather than oppositional. This is great. Contemporaneous rather than sequential. So it is not hot then cold. It is hot cold at the same time. Uh, and me, I like to call them non-oppositional dualities. However, they are in slight opposition. They are interdependent, interrelated, mutually engendering, mutually complementary, while also being mutually competitive and antagonistic towards each other. They are intrinsically related in their opposite nature. So when we have these pairings of day, night, boy, girl, hot, cold, they cannot exist without each other. They're constantly in attention. It is that tension that holds the universe together at the atomic level. Interesting, we talked about tension of magic on the first day. So when we take this idea of tension in this way and we weave these tensions together, you can make rope, malinali, which is grass, but also grass rope, the way rope is made of twisting and keeping it taut to make a thread, something that we can grab onto, not the individual fiber, but manipulating it into grass or rope. So malinali becomes a second layer of how things interact with each other. The anemic pairs become so twisted together that they form whole concepts. Birthday, money. It's not just no money and money. It is now lots of little things, concepts that are strung together. Then this is expressed in what is called nepantla. Nepantla means in-betweenness, something that is woven together. And there's a lot of words in the language that, that exemplify this. Um, including my, my, the time-space of body-land interactions yesterday that became really lovely. Um, when the, uh, when Sahagun was, inter you know, he's a Spanish chronicler after the conquest, was interviewing an indigenous man, he said, we, are, we ourselves are Nepantla, that the Aztecs at that time were neither indigenous nor Catholic. They didn't know what they were. They were in between the lines of the weave, trying to figure out which way to go. But there are words like... Um, Nenepantlatlalo, to love each other. You can see your nepantla in there. Deneplante motecani, to shit stir. You're getting in between a bunch of sitting, you're like, hey, I'm going to loosen this weave up. Motlata nepanua, to agree with what has been said. Denepantla moketzani, one who puts himself between a quarreling set of people to kind of calm them. Tikto nepantla tlashilia, to blame someone for something, to shift it so that it's now off of you into a middle ground. So nepantla becomes uh, an expression of liminality, an abundant reciprocity or mutuality, or perhaps an abundance or mutuality that consists of a dynamic condition of being abundantly middled, betwixt and between, something in the center. Fun little sun disc of, of the Aztec uh, death god in there, sticking his tongue out because he's going to taste you. 
<laughs> Alright. This is the, uh, now the anatomy of the soul and the body. So the body itself is comprised of this skeleton, which we know. These are our bones. They give us force, but the skeleton is borrowed from previous generations. In the failings of the previous universes, those bones were stored like cornmeal and formed into new bones. So human beings are made of corn. We're going to get to that in a, middle, uh, in a minute, us and Carol Channing. Um, but the body is here. The bones are coming back. And there are these three animistic centers coming here. Donali, which is your day sign. This is the head soul, your destiny. It contains a, a possibility of what you can accomplish. And there's Teolia, which is in your heart. This is your personality. It's associated with your breath. It is the things that you crave that only you crave. Different from your parents, different from your friends. What makes you unique? This is also the soul that in the Day of the Dead mythology that can come back and visit. Because this returns to the sky upon your death. And Yot, the liver soul, is life force. That returns to nature. Consequently, when plants die and yot is out there, if the person cut down the tree, it's the yot that becomes mal de aire, the air that comes through the night and kills people. It's decaying soul. This is the bad gas that escapes the body at death. So these three souls are constantly in balance in the person. The tonali can leave. Solas only occurs with tonali, because this one is not necessarily ours. Teolia, I mean, if your heart jumps out of your body, I guess maybe you can lose it, but you won't be able to get it back. Yot is only manipulatable, manipulatable by sorcerers. This is the phlegm that you can produce, but it must be returned. It's also associated with really, really bad smells. Um, this is why um, whores and gay men were considered excellent sorcerers, because they lived in a world of filth, which meant their yot was very strong. <laughs> um, so loving um, when death becomes the mother there. Beautiful. Okay. So, the notion of sacrifice little bit of a story there. The sacrifice of the gods. At the start of the current age, when the sun and the moon needed to be born, the gods called a big party in Teotihuacan, um, the land of the Toltecs. The Aztecs were actually from the Four Corners region of the United States, and they went down through Mexico and appropriated everything they could to give themselves credence, or to, you know, co-locate their own selves in this new landscape. So they inherited and took on the mythology of everybody around them. One of those things at Teotihuacan, which was an ancient, huge city with stone pyramids, they said the gods gathered and the, uh, the moon, which was the most beautiful person, the person that was going to become the moon, the most beautiful, but he was scared to jump into the flames and kill himself. Go figure. <laughs> the limping, smallpox sore-covered god came up and jumped right in before the moon god and became the sun, and the nobleness of his sacrifice was beautiful, and the gods then bloodlet onto the bodies of these two people to make them become the luminaries. The gods, traditionally, by the way, is through the tongue or through the penis is where you bloodlet. Um, both flow blood abundantly and heal up pretty quickly. Uh, I'm told that the blood through the tongue I've done, the penis, I'm, I'm leaving alone. <laughs> but the sacrifice of the gods must be repaid in order for the sun to stay in motion and keep going so that we don't burn up under the rays of this giant ball of fire. But the sacrifice of humans puts us in this balance in this cycle of death, regeneration, and life, constantly moving around. Just a little Christian nod there, too, of this, this easily taking on of the cycle of Jesus' sacrifice. You're going to find, we're going to talk about in a minute why this is so easily attachable, um, but Catholicism is an umbrella, not a dogma. Mechlan uh, Tukutli from the side. His liver flower is really pretty from this angle. Okay. So, this is breath, hegat. This is miklantekuti, death, back to back. The same being, right? The intimate pair there. And the 20 day signs around. The polarity between totona, heat, and sewia, cold. Again, always moving through this thing. Death is the cold side, the feminine side. Life is the, is the male side. We are hot because we live. We are live because we are hot. That was bad grammar, but hopefully makes sense. Um, I think the thing that's interesting about all of this, too, is more notes, because those are important. Uh, oh, it made me think of, the, of what we were talking about earlier with the noun verb side of things, that if this is the same concept, that living is therefore dying, and dying is therefore living. So living and deathing are the same process. In order to live, we must death. And in order to death, we must live. They cannot be uh, separated from each other. 
more liver, stylized liver soul hanging out there. Um, he's, you know, proper soldier. That's actually the back of a statue of a warrior um, with death hanging out because death is always on the back of every warrior. So in Aztec cosmology, it was not how you die, or it's how you die, not how you live, which is part of the justification for sacrifice. This, is, um, this, this man is a willing sacrifice, according to the, the record books, um, because he's very high. Um, they, they pelted the person's system with a lot of hallucinogens and convinced them they were the god being sacrificed. Um, is this duplicitous? Is this an act of theater? Or is this genuine transformational sacrifice in the way that this is how you, you the gods themselves are the ones being killed, not humans? We are dressing them in divinity so that they are saturated and the gods themselves are the ones that are dying and whose blood regenerates the universe. Keep in mind that the flower wars themselves, um, the, the most noble thing to do is to capture people alive. So rather than slaughter a village of 400, you picked the seven most beautiful, well-hung men and brought them back to the temple and killed them there. Um, not advocating for any practices, just trying to put it in context. Um, <laughs> But, uh, okay, so how you die, not how you live. This carries out further as the conception of the Aztec afterlife happens. If you die from a water-related death, you will join the rain gods. If you die in battle as a warrior, you will help the sun rise as it goes towards noon. If you are a woman who dies in childbirth, which was akin to war, because of the nature of the, this giving of life, you were to receive the sun at noon and help it set. Those ladies are scary. The Siwateteo are like energies of this crossroads women that seduce men that shouldn't be seduced, then they kill them and cause havoc. Um, any woman who dies in childbirth, warriors said they were the only thing more powerful than them. Their power was untamable. Okay. Uh, the, 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 the story behind that, it was Carol Channing, right? I'm not crazy. Um, where she, someone was in the stall next to her when she was pooping, and all they heard was, corn? When did I eat corn? Um, but corn is the substance of which humans are made. So this idea of making tortillas of your bones when you die, this is the structure of the Aztec afterlife for those that didn't lead an exemplary life. If you weren't so cool as to have been killed in battle, die in childbirth, or drown, or be sacrificed, you lived to a ripe old age, which meant you faded into nothingness. You didn't do anything of import. So you spent four years traveling through the Aztec afterlife, stripping yourself of anything that was you, till you get to the bottom layer of hell, and the queen, the lord and lady of death are waiting there for you, and they smash you and grind you in their mortar and pestle to make cornmeal of you and store you for the next generation when this sun inevitably fails and they have to recreate the universe again. Because what better to do than recycle? <laughs> Any farmer knows that. Okay, so this cycle of corn, we are corn. So this cyclic balance happens where we are, we are born through water, we rest at night, we have to lay horizontally to cool off our bodies from the heat of the sun that we are exposed to. The sun gives us life, but it scorches us. It takes our life away. It's an interesting side of it. If you imagine yourself as like a terracotta vessel of water, and that in order to work, you must have this water exposed to the sun, but you also have to guard it through... Um, I'm going to say mediocrity, that's not what I meant. Um, uh, uh, the middling of things. What is it? Moderation. That's the word. Obviously, I know nothing about that. Um, but you want evaporation to take place less, so you guard this fluid that is going through you, but you're still growing towards that which kills you. Life is hard. So this is Mortlatecutli on the left, the lady that's grabbing at the sun, waiting in the west. This is Kuaikwe, mother goddess, serpent skirt. The serpents are the lines of energy across the face of the earth. She wears a necklace of human hands. She takes your deeds. Hearts, she takes your personality and your tonali, your skull, the thing we recognize, the face you get. She doesn't have a head. Those are two spewing things of blood coming out of her neck wound that form her eye, two serpents of blood. Because her son, the sun god, cut off her head when he found out that uh, her daughter and the 400 stars rebelled against the mother because she got mysteriously pregnant from a ball of feathers that fell from the sky, as one does. <laughs> and uh, the son came fully armed out of her womb, slaughtered the sister, slaughtered the mother, and life goes on. Um, patriarchy and or the first ray of light is a bitch. Um, okay. So, conversion. The reason this is important is in language. 
something was done differently in Mesoamerica than had been done in Europe or any other for- area at the time in the world through Catholic conversion. Before this, they made you learn Latin. When the Franciscans, who were not the normal force, but they were the first ones that came to Mexico, they learned the lay native language. What this means is they translated the Bible and all catechism into Nahuatl. When, I'm, anybody in here speak more than one language? I'm assuming. Yes. You know there's no such thing as translation. Translation is, is, is the greatest ruse we can ever tell ourselves, that we understand how to do this thing. It's, it's a guess. It's a dance. It's all poetry at that point. What you do when that happens is they took all of the Hebrew names of God and substituted them with Aztec names of God. So Jesus is merely an expression of that which they already knew. They agglutinated Jesus. They didn't get rid of the old and put Jesus in. If Jesus is the son of Ipanemwani, a form of Tezcatlipoca or Emotecutli, then it's just, okay, Jesus is another God that's going to die for us. Cool. Great. (laughs) What this means is that Latin American Catholicism is born on a a supposition that, well, they kind of understand us enough. (laughs) Not necessarily that they actually understand from a complete obliteration of the native culture. This is why Hispanic Catholicism looks dramatically different than a lot of European Catholicism, which still has a lot of regional variances. Awesome. This is a folk dance costume. So, okay. Decimation is kind of a misleading term because it's not every tenth person, but like more like only one out of ten survived. Um, just the nature of this. So, war. The Aztec conquest. Um, there's a lot of stories told about it that are not true, but the Aztecs made a lot of enemies very quickly by conquering. They were only an empire for 250 years. They came in and built one of the largest empires on the planet with some of the tallest buildings on the planet, with the largest library on the planet, and all on islands in the middle of a really smelly, smelly, stinky salt lake. Um, The Spaniards that wrote letters home were in awe because it was taller than any cathedral they'd ever seen. The letters they first wrote home said that they must obviously have been Christians who were converted by the devil to heathenry because there's no way they could be this scientifically advanced without being Christian first. It confused them. They also had a habit of writing and exaggerating things we know because their letters don't all match up because they were trying to get funding for their expeditions to go look for more gold. So make it good if you're going to try and impress the court, especially the ladies. Um, who thrived. Those letters were published in Spain, the drama of the New World and the conquest, and put out like pamphlets of like, look what these brave Spaniards are doing over there, and look how bloody these savages are. It was propaganda to secure money to then bring money back. Doesn't mean the Aztecs weren't doing anything. They were killing lots of people. Okay. After war, we get the devastation of, which was quite a few number of people died in in the initial conquest and the wave, But then we get smallpox came, 12 million dead in the first 15 years. Up to 25 million dead from smallpox in the whole two American continents. It devastates the native population. Then we get the lovely force of colonization on top of it. Colonization starts destroying cultures to the point of, of, uh, well, I'm not even going to, you understand what that means. Um, Let's save time. The other side of it in designing Latin America should be spoken. Um, This is a quote from Eduardo Galeano, and this is to understand the context of Latin American thought. Um, Eduardo Galeano is an Uruguayan poet and author. He's fantastic. His Memory of Fire trilogy, if you've not read it, concurrently tells the creation of the universe up until past and past the conquest from indigenous African and European ideas and stories in small paragraphs, skipping around between them. Um, it's outstanding. But this is from Open the Veins of Latin America. The division of labor among nations is is that some specialize in winning and others in losing. Our part of the world, known today as Latin America, was precocious. It is specialized in losing ever since those remote times when Renaissance (laughs) Europeans ventured across the ocean and buried their teeth in the throats of the Indian civilizations. Centuries passed and Latin America perfected its roles. It continues to exist in in the service of others' needs as a source and reserve of oil and iron, of copper and meat, of fruit and coffee, the raw materials and foods destined for rich countries which profit more from consuming them than Latin America does from producing them. Latin America is the region of open veins. This is from The Invisibles, if anybody recognizes it. (laughs) This is Mictlán Tecutli or Mictlán Sihuat. They wear these paper hats which were used for the impermanence Wearing paper showed that paper was going... This is blood sacrifice was done on paper and burnt on the coals. Um, 
Other interesting statistic I just read today, one third of the world's murders take place in Latin America. Latin America is 8.5% of the world's population. 85% um, of those murders take place in Mexico, Brazil, Honduras, and El Salvador. 95% of those murders take pla are p men who are between 15 and 22. La migra, la mota. Okay, so uh, obviously immigration issues continue to, to plague Latin America. Um, there's the expression within, um, I'm Chicano by birth. My family is, if we talk about the 100 years of modernity, my family is 100 years out of Mexico. My mother was, my grandfather was born in this country. Um, my mother's mother was born in New Mexico and her ancestry goes back documented to before the conquest. So 1612 we know her ancestors and before, but New Mexico was Spain at that time. And then it got absorbed in the US. We are the, we are the Mexicans that the border crossed. So the, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us theme. This is uh, a drug raid in 2016, I believe. Um, those are bricks of pot. Um, the drug trafficking of, of Mexico is a plague. And it is also the thing that makes this even harder. People that are trying to come over to work are plagued by this, this idea, which is there because ends, ends cannot meet in Latin America. There is no way to get ahead unless you're involved in illegal operations or on the side of manipulating people to take money. Or both. And there she comes. So this is the Virgin of Guadalupe. This is mother, Empress of the Americas, mother to the peoples. This is La Morena. This is the virgin that came in 1640 something, 1619 through 1622. Then comes the fact that she shows up on the hill where that other snake lady with the, with the head and the blood coming out, shows up on the hill where that deity is worshipped to an Aztec man and says, I am the mother of Teot Dios, meaning I am the mother of Aztec God and European God. Build me a temple here. Not to Jesus. Build me a temple. The cloak that he was wearing, which was made out of maguey fiber, this is a photograph of it. It is believed that he gathered roses as one of the signs of her presence, and when he unfolded it before the bishop, this image of her was on it. It is supernatural artwork. It is mysteriously changed form, because originally she was on a serpent, but we don't know where the serpent is anymore, because maybe it got painted, but it's not paint, but it is, but don't question miracles. <laughs> so she's cloaked. There are symbols here. She's wearing the Aztec midwife belt, showing that she's about to push something out. This is the woman clothed with the sun. Right, so she's blocking out the sun or emanating with the sun following her, the crescent moon, and the little convenient Mexican national colored flag baby wings here. Um, here's an image of her merged with Coatlicue. So the nature of syncretization is important because, let me just find this here. If we're talking about syncretism and especially hybridity, language syncretism, it's important to know that syncretism under colonization is not voluntary. It is non-consensual. It is the dominant culture exerting its influence upon another culture. We see this in modern culture through memes. So even if someone says, like, I'm going to make this new word up, it's amazing, and introduces it, if it doesn't take off, it doesn't take off. The old days, memes were, <laughs> you're European and you're indigenous. The European's going to win out. There are 36 classifications of race in the new world. I'm, my father is of Western European descent. My mother is Mexican. My half-brother is, uh, his father is black, and we have the same mother. My brother is third from the bottom in the racial classifications. I'm third from the top. We would never be allowed to see each other uh, under colonial lens. So syncretization is something that is, is going on whether they, we want it to or not, but it's also being designed. It's being designed from the top down as a control mechanism and from the bottom up as a subversion mechanism. How can we hide what we hold dear in plain sight? He's awesome. <laughs> so where do we go from here? And I use this, where do we go? This is important to discuss because if we're looking at the thing that really is the fabric of what is it that makes death our mother, all these things we've talked about, enamic pairs, the different souls of the body, if we're journeying towards the lady of death, we have to understand that life death is one thing. If we're worshiping her, we're worshiping her. If we're worshiping her, we're worshiping her. In Mexican parlance, there's a common term. It's called cuate. Cuate means it's your twin, your best friend. The th it's the relationship because the word cuate comes from cuate, snake. It's the relationship of the snake with its shed. 
They are one and the same. One is the expression of the other, back and forth. Who's the snake and who's the shed? You never know. But this idea, especially here when we're talking about a life deity and a death deity, serpent, shed, serpent, shed. They are twins. It's the anemic pair expressing itself again. It cannot be gone, especially when you consider that the Bible, as translated into Nawak, is using the words themselves that preserve the understanding of anemic pairs, of non-oppositional duality, throughout it. When we get into the complex mythology of Santísima Muerte, uh, in, her, in, the nor- in the northern area, we talk about her in the three robes. Head soul, heart soul, liver soul. Still expressing themselves. By the time you're done with your first three breaths, there is an invisible reaper just beyond the left hand sitting there. This is the death that will kill you. She's already there. How you color her is based on your actions in life. So if we worship the white soul, the white robe, the reason we put her in the middle is because this is the robe of old age. The Christians gave us one thing, supposedly, which is a Christian soul. So the white soul, the head soul, becomes emphasized because we gain it at baptism. It becomes locked in. We get to live forever now. We don't get to be obliterated into cornmeal. So... The white one is the one we return to. If I'm working the red one for love, this is what gets the blood pumping. Love, sex, money. This is all the passions in life. But if I work that, I want to go back to the white because expressing the red all the time means I'm more likely to die from sudden violent death, passionate death. What is the black soul, the liver soul? This is decay. This is cancer. This is loneliness. This is solitude. It's an extremely powerful sorceress robe but this robe, the white robe, was born when Eve took the bite out of the apple, when we do uh, Creole mythology here. The red robe is born when Eve and Adam have sex. The black robe is born when Cain kills Abel. Mm. They're different expressions of La Wasuda, of the bone mother, that originally was there. So where do we go from here <laughs> at nauseam? Um, I like that he looks like Slenderman. <laughs> it's like there's a whole thing there. I don't, I don't really know where we go. I, you know, growing up in Southern California, Chicanismo is a, a weird thing. This, even the fact that I'm using Nahuatl cosmology to describe all these things, I'm not from the Nahuatl people. My ancestry is Hopi. My ancestry is uh, Otomi, which is a Central Valley Mexican uh, indigenous population. But both of the, the groups that my family come from had their native identity stripped from them and the language replaced. So what happened in the 50s and 60s with the Chicano revival? Neo-fascism. Let's take the Aztec Empire's remnants and now make it the lingua franca of everyone whose soul was obliterated, whose culture was obliterated. So there's this strange nationalism seeking in for a nation that never existed. We, we call California Calif Aztlan. Aztlan is the home of the Aztecs. It is the away place, the place that which we hearken to a reality that never existed. It's a nostalgia for something that never existed. And they're fighting for it with everything they have. It's confronting the death of hopes that we're never even allowed to see the light of day. So where do we go when the world is falling apart? I'm not sure. Death still waits for us. Either way. Perched. <laughs> Very happily. The only thing that I move past this in through is that there's hope in sharing, there's hope in breath exchange, the breath lives on when you breathe it in, and there's hope in poetry, even though as destabilizing force it is, and Nahuatl is the most poetic of languages that I have found. It has something called disfrasismos in Spanish. And disfrasismos are two pairings of words that have nothing to do with each other most likely, but there is something born from their pairing. So. Um, the Seba, the oak, two different trees. Or the Seba, the cypress, let's start with there. Seba, the cypress is the word for an elected leader. They are strong like the cypress, and they are tall and flamboyant like the Seba. This is a quality of leadership. The Seba, the oak, a respected elder. It's putting these two trees together to say something poetically. The garbage, the filth, sex, not because of a judgment. Sex is smelly and dirty. The earth is slippery. The first thing a midwife said to a baby when it came out is, welcome to the world of pain and toil. May you stand on it well. Fight. The words for war and peace are the same. It is struggle. Existence is a struggle. 
We must keep in motion in order to produce anything in this life. So li living is dying, dying is living. So with this disfrasismo, I like to look at even Santissima Muerte, Santa Muerte's name as a disfrasismo. La Santa, la Muerte, the holy, the death. What is the pairing of these two words? What makes death holy? How you live. So there's a hope even in the fact that we are appealing to this amazingly cross-legged image in, her, in their paper hat. That something even in the name tells us the key. It is to live. Living is dying, dying is living. There is no separation. If you are looking at it through an outside lens, you are trying to do away with death because you're only going to promote light. This will only make death come back stronger. There is no way to, to separate that balance, especially with the history of Mexico being what it is, the history of Latin America being what it is, and the future history being what it is. Um, that's it. Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a lecture entitled Apocalyptic Corazon by Jesse Hathaway Diaz. Collected papers from the Rewriting the Future conference will be coming out this fall from Tripart Books, so keep an eye out for that. In the meantime, you can visit our website, psychartcult.org, that's P-S-Y-C-H-A-R-T-C-U-L-T dot org. And you can visit Jesse's website, serpentshod.com and wolfandgoat.com. And now, Inner Underworld from a new album I made with Henrik Bjork entitled Inner Underworld. Enjoy.